So regardless, um, happy Friday. Uh, welcome to this this week's AMS SM Sports Ultrasound Case Series. Um, this week, we we are fortunate to have Christina Giacomazzi from, from out from uh, the, the West Coast. So it is quite early there for her. So I appreciate her being here um, and, and spending some time with us. So she she's originally from California. She somehow got lured into the in the Midwest. Did her uh, medical school at Michigan State. Um, immediately left and went right back out to the West Coast to the Pumanar residency at Stanford. Um, she's the current sports fellow at the University of Washington and is staying out in California, uh, down in San Diego for her job at Kaiser um, at the end of this <clears throat> of this academic year. So today she's going to be talking to us about volar hand uh, pulley injuries. And with that, I will pass it on over to Christina. Okay, thank you. Um, so is everything okay on my slide? Yep, that looks perfect. Okay, great. Um, so hi everyone. Um, again, I'll be talking about the volar hand and pulley injuries um, and specifically in the context of a case I saw this year. And I have no disclosures. And here are a lot of the people I wanna thank this year at the University of Washington. Uh, for my ultrasound education, as well as my sports medicine education. And specifically, I'll thank Dr. Eric Latska, who's in charge of our ultrasound curriculum. And he also has helped me with this case. And I want to thank EMSSM for this opportunity and specifically ultrasound committee heads. So my objectives today will be to review volar hand anatomy, understand the scanning protocol for the ultrasound evaluation of the volar hand, and this is specifically pertaining to pulley injuries, and then identify normal and pathologic sonographic findings, and then finally compose a diagnostic report. So we'll start with my case, who was a 27-year-old right-handed male professional rock climber, and he presented with one week of left ring finger pain. And this happened acutely when he was practicing on an indoor rock climb and he was using something called crimp grip. And he acutely heard and felt a pop and had pain in his finger. So he immediately let go and he had to stop climbing and he had swelling and slight bruising in his volar hand. And he was referred to us specifically by hand surgery for ultrasound evaluation of pulley injury. And I highlight here uh, an underlying left ring finger because this is the most classic case of pulley injuries affecting the non-dominant side and the ring finger specifically. He also has the most common pulley that is injured that we'll find out later. And then I also highlight crimp grip because some people might be wondering what is crimp grip? Um, and this is where the PIP is in flexion of about 90 degrees and the DIP is in hyperextension and there is both closed and open or full and half crimp types, closed being the thumb having a lock over the index finger. And this puts an excessive amount of strain on the pulleys. We actually have a video um, of the injury occurring that our patient has allowed us to use uh, for educational purposes. So I will advise you to um, listen closely and then look at the uh, circle there. <laughs> So there was a loud pop um, heard before he kind of yelped and went off and he was using crimp grip on a very small hold. Um, so the crimp grip is typically used on uh, small holds. On physical examination one week later on inspection, he had moderate swelling at his proximal phalanx. He had no evidence of something called bowstringing. And so bowstringing is where the tendon has moved away from the bone. Uh, and this is clinical bowstringing. So he did not have any evidence of that. He had tenderness to palpation at his metacarpal body and head and proximal phalanx. And then when we asked him to make a fist, um, his composite flexion of his ring finger was two centimeters short from his distal palmar crease. 
he was able to activate all uh, joints though. Um, so we suspected his flexor tendons were intact. We used uh, something called a, a dynamometer to measure finger strength prior to our ultrasound examinations. Um, and the reason that we do this is to ensure that the patient is generating some force during the dynamic parts of the examination. And so our symptomatic left side, he was using 1.8 kilograms of resistance, and this was much less uh, used um, much less than his asymptomatic right side, which was six kilograms of resistance. For imaging, he didn't have any prior imaging, um, but again, this is always important to review if available. And this is especially the case in children um, as growth plate injuries and specifically in rock climbers are much more common uh, than pulley injuries. So one thing with imaging also you might wonder is, is ultrasound the best imaging modality for pulley injuries in general? And um, a lot of people think yes, including myself, um, for reasons being it has better resolution and so therefore it's more sensitive for partial tears. Um, it's dynamic uh, with, um, and you can use flexion resistance. It's point of care, so it doesn't require insurance authorization. However, the one large downside is that this, there is a high learning curve, and this is in comparison to MRI imaging. So for our scanning considerations, our patient position, we prefer them to be seated with a towel underlying their wrist and the wrist and finger in extension. For transdis transducer type, we use two different transducers. We use a hockey stick initially um, or a smaller footprint transducer. And then we switch to a linear wider footprint transducer for measuring our tendon phalanx distance or tendon bone distance, which I'll talk about later. And it is most ideal if this probe covers the entire width of the proximal phalanx. Our differential for acute volar hand pain and specifically in rock climbers, um, highest on our differential is a lot of the time pulley injuries. However, there are other ligamentous, bony and tendinous um, problems that can certainly happen. And that leads us into our uh, complete uh, protocol that we use. And as uh, Dr. Betcher said in his trigger finger, lecture in early February, um, CMS and AIUM do not have a specific digit protocol recommendation and therefore just recommend that you look at the bones and periarticular soft tissue structures and so that's what we typically do. Uh, we look at the a, all of the A pulleys, um, also known as annular pulleys, one through five. We look at the volar palmar plate for ligaments, for bones and joints. Um, we look at all of these. And then our tendons, we look at the FDS and FDP. And then briefly, our digital neurovascular structures. You can also consider a collateral ligament evaluation, interossei evaluation, and lumbricol evaluation based on your clinical suspicion. So knowing the pulley anatomy is um, really important, um, especially because of all of the proximity to all of the structures. Um, and so um, pulleys are just ligaments again, and uh, they are very important for the normal flexor mechanism of our hand. Um, there are five annular pulleys, a1 through A5 as seen here. And I like to break this down into our joint pulleys, um, which are the odd pulleys. So A1, A3, and A5 are overlying or very just proximal to uh, our joints. A1, MCP, A3, the PIP, and A5, the DIP. Um, and they arise from our volar plates, which are also ligaments. We then have our bone pulleys, uh, A2 and A4, that arise from A2 from our proximal phalanx and A4 from our middle phalanx. And again, these are going to be um, our most injured pulleys. Um, 
typically acutely, um, A2 being number one and A4 shortly after. Um, and these two pulleys are the most important uh, for pinch and grasp. And you can imagine if you don't have these structures over your flexor tendons um, that you can get something uh, called bowstringing um, or anterior bowstringing where the tendons have moved away from the bone. Um, and this puts the tendons at a mechanical disadvantage and can impair function. There are also cruciate pulleys, uh, one through three as seen here um, that are harder to evaluate via ultrasound. And so we're just gonna be focusing on the annular pulleys. Moving on to our ultrasound evaluation, uh, again, finding a home base is always very uh, important. Um, and so we typically use um, the MCP joint and A1 pulley as our home base. And you can always go back to this pulley um, and the first one, if you're confused about where you are and watch that come off um, and watch the new pulley start. And again, this is a long axis to the pulley and it can be confusing because typically we're looking at the tendon. And so this is short axis to the tendon and bone, but it's actually long axis to our pulley. And this is what we're gonna be describing as long axis throughout our presentation as the pulley is our primary interest um, and, and target. And so what are we looking for in these images? We're looking for the shadows around the flexor tendons as seen in the circle here. These hypoechoic shadows, we're looking to make sure they have a connection to the bone on either side. We're looking for an effusion or hypoechogenicity. And typically this is underlying our flexor tendons. We're also looking for thickness uh, of the pulley and most often this is superficial. And so the A1 pulley is seen in this animation of what I was trying to describe, um, forming a roof over the flexor tendons. And at this level, the FDP is deep and the FDS is superficial. So now we'll turn on that A1 pulley in uh, the other axis. And now um, seen to the right, we're in short axis to our pulley, long axis to our flexor tendons. And in this view, we see the pulley as a kind of half circle as seen in this animation and it is relatively hypoechoic to the surrounding structures. And on this, we'll have them, uh, we'll have them perform um, flexion, resisted flexion. And here we're looking for uh, triggering. We're looking to see if there may be an, an effusion that um, is evaluated underneath uh, the tendons. Um, and then also I'll direct your attention to uh, the head of the metacarpal, which can be a good indicator in imaging when you're looking at these images of where you are because it is typically circular in appearance and has an overlying um, hypoechoic articular cartilage. Um, and throughout this presentation, I will bring in my note. And so we finished evaluating the A1 pulley and therefore in our note, we write the A1 pulley overlying the MCP joint is intact. There is no evidence of pulley thickening or dynamic triggering with flexion and extension. And now we will move on from our A1 pulley, our first joint pulley, to our A2 pulley at the proximal phalanx, as seen up here. And we're going to look at normal and abnormal findings. So I just kind of told you this is going to be uh, abnormal in our case. And again, this is long axis technically to the pulley, short axis to the tendons, and to the right is going to be radial, and I'll keep that consistent throughout this presentation, um, and the left is ulnar. So this is, again, it looks very similar to our A1 pulley and is viewed um, as normal. Um, and we see a hypoechoic shadow surrounding our flexor tendons. Um, we don't see any significant thickening. We don't see any significant effusion underlying uh, the tendon. 
And it kind of looks like this animation here of a roof over the flexor tendons. However, when we look at our case, um, we see something different. So we see that our roof looks slightly abnormal um, in that it has lost its connection to the bone on the ulnar side. We don't see that hypo echogenicity that is typically here on this side, um, which would make us concerned that there is pathology and potentially a um, rupture on this side. Additionally, we also see that there's some superficial migration of part of the flexor tendons. And at this level, it is um, the FDS tendon. We think it's superficially migrated. Um, and so now that we have seen, again, that in one view, we want to confirm it in our other view. And so we'll look again at normal versus abnormal of our A A2 pulley now in short axis, still at our proximal phalanx. Short axis to the pulley, long axis to the tendons. Um, to the right is going to be distal, and to the left um, is going to be proximal. And I'll also keep that consistent throughout this presentation. And so here uh, we can look for something slightly different, which is we're looking for the tendon um, and its proximity to the bone. And so here is a picture of normal first. Um, and we see right here that there is no um, effusion underlying the flexor tendons. We see that it looks um, on static imaging fairly close in proximity to the bone. And then we have the patient dynamically do resisted flexion. And we're looking for any effusion that appears or any movement away from the bone. And we don't see any evidence of that. You could imagine that might be one to two millimeters. Then our case is seen here, and we see with static imaging, it looks different. Um, there is um, hypoechogenicity uh, um, underneath the flexor tendons, uh, consistent with an effusion. The tendon has moved away from the bone. And then with resisted flexion, we see that distance increases. And this distance has a name and is called the tendon phalanx distance or the tendon bone distance, so which makes a lot of sense to me. So that's really nice. Um, and we measure this um, at rest and then with resisted finger flexion. And what we got when we measured this was 3.4 millimeters and 4.6 millimeters with his finger flexion. Um, so you can either do this measurement or um, also importantly, um, you can also compare to the contralateral side. And so you might wonder, what do these numbers mean? Um, so here are the numbers we use um, at the University of Washington for our normals and then for full tears. Um, and this is specific for our A2 tendon. Um, and so we use under two and under three millimeters, under two for the tendon phalanx distance at rest, under three for resisted flexion, partial tears kind of in between, and then full tears greater than three millimeters at rest and greater than four millimeters with resisted flexion. And please note that there are different values for A4 pulley injuries. They're slightly a little bit lower. Um, and I say our institution because there are studies on these numbers. However, there is inconsistency in the literature. And um, so we'll talk about that um, on the next slide. But our patient, again, was consistent with the full tear as suspected um, by um, both of our short and long axis imaging. And so again, where and how do we measure the tendon phalanx distance? Because a lot of people are doing it slightly different. Uh, well, we actually presented this at AMSSM this past year, because this is something Dr. Um, Lotska is uh, fairly uh, passionate about um, in developing a consistency uh, for these numbers. Um, as people are measuring this distance from many different areas on this proximal phalanx. And also a lot of them 
um, in the images from the literature do not really have a consistent landmark in here. Um, whereas our images try to incorporate um, the metacarpal phalangeal joint in all of our images as a good landmark. So I'll explain our technique next for um, measuring the A2 tendon phalanx distance. We first measure the length of the proximal phalanx um, and then measure this midpoint. So just measure the midpoint of the proximal phalanx. And then slide the probe proximally um, so that you can flex the PIP, but make sure to just keep this metacarpal phalangeal joint in view so that other people looking at your images moving forward um, know that you are in uh, the middle of the proximal phalanx. And this is why I described earlier that we switched to a linear probe and not a hockey stick, because as you can imagine, if you're trying to get uh, the MCP joint and the middle of the proximal phalanx in view, you might need a larger footprint transducer. And then again, we measure this distance at both rest and resisted flexion. And then again, you can, another option is just comparing with the contralateral side looking for differences in your diagnosis. So we have finished our A1 and A2 pulleys, and now we'll move on to all the rest of the pulleys, as well as the rest of our complete examination. And it is really important, even if you see one pulley rupture, to evaluate all the other pulleys, as oftentimes multiple pulley injuries might mean the difference between recommending conservative versus surgical management. Um, and so um, we'll move on now to our second joint pulley or the A3 pulley, again, located at our PIP joint. And so we're looking for similar things here. We're looking for continuity um, in relation to the bone. So again, the shadow um, that has continuity on both sides. We're looking for an effusion underlying the flexor tendons and thickening. We don't see any evidence both in long access to the pulley and short access to the pulley here. Similarly, with our A4 pulley, which we wanna look at very closely also, as this is the second most common pulley injured in rock climbers over uh, the middle phalanx, um, we see that there is continuity of our shadow, uh, no effusion, no thickening, and then a similarly in um, short access to the pulley, long access to the tendons, we don't see any significant effusion underlying the flexor tendons. So we have written here, the A4 pulley overlying the middle phalanx is intact. And then similarly with our A5, which it's really hard to see the A5 sometimes, um, but we still try to look at it. Um, and it was intact in our athlete. And then we'll move on to the rest of our parts of our evaluation. And the volar or palmar plate gave me a lot of issues at the beginning of understanding its anatomy as it has a quite a unique shape. And again, this is just a ligament um, that overlies our joints in our finger, our volar finger, and it enhances the stability of the joint as well as limit hyperextension. And it has this unique shape due to these uh, check rein ligaments that are a part of the volar plate, it kind of looks like a tooth in my opinion. And so you don't wanna forget about these check rein ligaments when you're evaluating uh, the whole part of the volar plate. And so here we see an example of, we've already seen this picture, but now I'm gonna highlight the volar plate. And so I was trying, we were trying to figure out what does this look like? Like, what does this shape look like? Kind of looks like a funnel, maybe. Like this is a larger opening to a funnel. This is a smaller opening to a funnel. Some people brought out the idea that it maybe looks like the Patriots logo, although, I don't know how I feel about that. Dr. Lotzka likes that idea a lot more than me. I, after seeing that, I could not stop thinking that the metacarpal head really looks like the San Francisco logo. So um, we'll take a look. Um, again, the point being that it has an abnormal shape and don't forget to um, include the check rein ligaments um, proximally. And so we're looking again here for dynamic hyperextension, um, not flexion now, because um, this resists hyperextension. 
And then we're looking for any um, disruptions in continuity, any effusion that arises. And this structure is relatively homogeneous to its surroundings um, and relatively hypoechogenic compared to the uh, underlying bone and the tendons um, above. And we see those three volar plates and the volar plate at all of these joints were intact without evidence of tear or avulsion on dynamic hyperextension. Same picture, but now we're just looking at the bones uh, to complete our examination, uh, which appeared unremarkable without evidence of effusion, bony erosion, or osteophytes. The flexor tendons are also on our uh, complete evaluation, but Dr. Betcher gave a uh, very detailed and great talk about this in February, so I won't discuss their relationship in as much detail, but um, it is important to know that the FTP initially is deep to the FDS and the FDS splits at our favorite level, our A2 proximal phalanx level, um, and has this unique shape and cross section. And then it um, moves actually deep to FDP and then inserts on the middle phalanx as seen here. And then you just have DIP um, distally. And so that's what we have seen in our images. Um, and the thing that we note in our ultrasound, um, in our ultrasound report was that there was this superficial migration of the flexor tendon um, at the level of the A2 pulley. Um, and we suspect this is due to that pulley injury, not um, bringing it down to the bone like it's supposed to, but we didn't see any other evidence of tendinopathy such as thickening or tendon fiber disruption um, at all to suggest other tears. And then finally, um, our nerve neurovascular structures, our digital vessels and nerve, um, we take a look at very briefly, um, starting from the level of the mid palm and extending out to the finger, we can see um, them lying um, just on the sides of our flexor tendons as seen here. And there was no um, focal compression or swelling that we observed. And so finally, I'll wrap up with uh, report writing and our uh, diagnostic report. We typically use more of a bullet point um, technique, especially because we usually put numbers in there, which are easier to read bullet points. Um, and I'll just, I talked about a lot of this, but I'll highlight the pertinence that our A2 pulley overlying the proximal phalanx was torn at its ulnar side. And therefore, at its radial side, um, it appeared to have rolled back on itself. Um, and there was an effusion between the proximal phalanx and the flexor tendons. And we measured the tendon phalanx distance at rest and um, with resisted flexion, which were in our ranges of acute rupture as well. And then we mentioned under the flexor tendons that that FDS at the proximal phalanx level was superficially migrated. And so for our impression on our note, uh, we wrote left ring finger A2 fully complete rupture. Um, we do typically include like the most um, important or prominent picture, which is usually of our tendon phalanx distance showing the effusion underlying the flexor tendons as well. Um, and so in summary, uh, ultrasound is the best modality for pulley injuries, but in the right hands. Um, and knowing your anatomy is really important. Um, looking for um, knowing the joint pulleys versus the bone pulleys. And consider using a standardized approach for measuring the tendon phalanx distance for A2 pulley specifically. Um, if you're going to measure this distance, um, consider looking at the midpoint of the proximal phalanx using the MCP as a landmark. And you often have to use a linear probe in this. And then comparing with contralateral again um, also can be extremely useful. So thank you. And here's my email. 
All right. Thanks, Christina. That was that was really well done. You know, that's a that's a complicated area. I think your review of the anatomy was was very well done. Your pictures were fantastic. Um, so so really, really great job. I just I have a couple points to make quickly. Um, and I'm sure Doug will have a, a point or two. I think the most important point to make, which is this is a really important learning um, learning concept. There's there's robust very high level, very exceptionally well done literature that states that the appearance of the volar plate is actually more comparable to a Chicago bear. So just something <laughs> to keep in mind. Um, so I, just, I just wanted to, I wanted to throw, throw that out there. Um, um, a couple other things. So, so your, your protocol there is actually pretty, pretty darn similar and pretty close to mine uh, for a complete protocol of the volar hand, well, at least the volar um, fingers or digits and, and, you know, being able to add, you know, different structures based on the clinical question is important, but I thought you did a great job outlining, you know, a, a, a complete examination there. And then I think your points about dynamic imaging are, are exceptionally important. And so I've, I've been close to being burned a couple of times where, you know, for a, for an a, a A2 or an A4 pulley injury, you know, you're looking for fluid, um, anechoic fluid deep to the flexor tendon, superficial to to the phalanx, and and sometimes that fluid um, can can be rather subtle. Um, but when you have the the patient, you know, with resisted um, dynamic finger flexion, you can really see some bowstringing and really see you know an increase in the amount of fluid you know in that region, which which makes the injury a bit more conspicuous, and so. I, I always, you know, harp on folks to really pay attention to dynamic imaging here. It's obviously one of the, the, the pros of, of ultrasound and one of the reasons why we, why we use it so much. So, so I think your, your point about using dynamic imaging, um, especially for A2, A4 pulley injury is, um, is really important here. Uh, Doug, do you have any, anything you want to add? Yeah, Christine, that was an A plus <clears throat> presentation, really well done. I guess just to highlight, you know, I fully agree with the protocol and, you know, the temptation is in the patient like this is to go right to where it hurts and go to the volar aspect. But as we've talked about, you know, discipline with the protocol. So all my patients, when I evaluate finger injuries, I start uh, with the hand, um, with the palmer aspect down, go right to the joints. And when you evaluate the joints, you also see the flex or extensor tendons um, in the same image. And, uh, and if appropriate, I'll look at the sagittal band and then flip it over and stick with the protocol. Um, again, to highlight the importance of dynamic imaging, it makes the pulleys more conspicuous as does the volar plate. So even, you know, normal pulleys are a very thin echogenic line and, and you can really help make them more visible um, just with dynamic imaging. And so if you're doing a fair amount of hand stuff, the hockey stick becomes really important because you, you limit full flexion sometimes uh, with um, a regular linear array pro, but with the hockey stick. And that's my only Minnesota contribution, contribution since we don't have a professional football team in Northern Minnesota, but um, it's the hockey. But, uh, you know, the <laughs> hockey stick, it really, really helps um, allow full flexion. And, and I tend to do my trigger finger releases now with hockey sticks because I, again, for that very reason. Um, but again, I just want to emphasize you really hit all the points very well. And that was just a very well done presentation. Yeah, th thanks. Thanks again, Christina. That's that was exactly what we want with this case series presentation. So I thought you did. You did a really great job. So thanks. Thanks for doing that. And thanks for getting up uh, Thank so you. early to, <laughs> to do that. Thanks. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> all right, so I will let everybody get back to their Friday. Just a quick reminder, uh, off next week and then on 6-11, there's a bit of a change in the schedule. However, the uh, Duke fellows, all three of them are going to triple team the talk that week. Um, and that talk will be a bit different. Uh, it'll be on kind of thoracal abdominal trauma, specifically pneumothorax. Um, so again, that's 6-11. Uh, that's Otherwise, everybody have a great Friday, great weekend, and, and thanks again, Christina. Great job.